All right, everybody, welcome to your uh, last talk before afternoon tea. Super exciting. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Fraser Tweedale. Uh, Fraser works at Red Hat on identity management systems. And today he is here to talk about uh, integrating external authentication with uh, Python web apps. Take it away, Fraser. Thanks, everyone, for uh, coming to my talk. Can everyone hear me OK? Um, I've got a bit of a cold, so I'm probably going to be talking quite softly to preserve my voice. So yes, I do work at Red Hat on identity management things, uh, mainly on certificate management. So I'm the PKI guy. Uh, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. I'm going to talk about uh, yeah, external authentication, why you want to do it or to be able to support it. Um, the advantages it's bring, it brings and, and how to do it for Python web apps. Um, so I guess the 30,000 foot view is that identity silos are bad. Um, don't build your apps as identity silos. Um, so the disadvantages of identity silos, particularly in a single organization, are that you know, users aren't good at remembering two dozen passwords for different services. Um, chances are they'll just end up picking really bad passwords or using the same password everywhere. Um, and you don't want them doing that. But then there's also a whole lot of administrative overheads in maintaining identities in identity silos. Um, this is um, a problem for businesses, um, corporations, and also uh, open source projects. If you have a large open source project, say, for example, you know, the Python project, Python Software Foundation has um, many different services that they maintain. Uh, so identity silos there also have all of the same problems that you have uh, within organizations and businesses. There's um, federated identity for the open web. So these are things like um, OpenID or OpenID Connect, um, you know, sign in with Facebook, sign in with GitHub. And there are Python projects, uh, including Python Social Auth and All Auth, um, that are solving um, or Im implementing these identity management uh, solutions for Python. But not all apps are uh, built for public consumption. Some of you in this room are probably working on applications um, that are for internal use in your organization. Uh, and even for general applications um, that could be useful within an organization or could be useful as public, publicly accessible applications um, still need to have their identity stored somewhere. So even if you're writing, for example, uh, no, it's not a Python app, but WordPress. Uh, people deploy WordPress internally and externally. So being able to support um, external authentication is a desirable characteristic if you're building applications like that. So what's identity management? Um, identity management is basically having all centralized identity management is a centralized store where all of your um, host service and user information um, can be stored as well as access policies um, and other kinds of related information. So various solutions in this space include Free IPA, uh, which is one of the projects I work on at Red Hat, Active Directory, which of course is um, basically king in the, in the Windows sphere, and plain old LDAP, so just using a bare um, directory. And yeah, they're used by corporations, open source projects, and um, define your users' groups access policies, and also provide your authentication and authorization services. So these will be um, endpoints where you can actually query, hey, you know, is this um, username uh, and password valid, or is a particular um, user authorized to access this resource? They provide these facilities. Um, single sign-on is a facility provided um, by a number of different technologies, including Kerberos and SAML. Um, Free IPA implements the Kerberos um, Key Distribution Center. Um, this provides security in that um, your users only really need to remember one password, so password fatigue is not an issue, and the protocols themselves um, are secure. Convenience, once you're logged in, you're logged into all of the apps that you need to access until such time as your ticket or your, your Kerberos ticket or your SAML assertion expires. Um, they're great for onboarding, so you don't have to go and tell each application about the users in your organization. The applications uh, can just 
receive this information by way of receiving the ticket. And you avoid the duplication of data and duplication of administrative effort. So uh, Kerberos and SAML are, are two of the SSO protocols. There are others, including OpenID Connect, um, SSO for the open web, like I mentioned earlier. Um, Kerberos is a ticket-based authentication protocol. Um, Active Directory provides a Kerberos KDC, uh, MIT Kerberos and Heimdall are other uh, free software implementations. And it's supported with browsers via the HTTP negotiate extension. We'll see an example of that in the demo shortly. Um, SAML is an XML, very enterprisey sort of format, um, where service providers uh, receive assertions which contain attributes, and these are cryptographically secure, um, but do require uh, an agreement between the um, service provider and the identity provider. FreeIPA is a centralized identity management system. You manage your users group services, as I mentioned earlier. Um, your Kerberos KDC and also host base uh, access control policies. And um, the system security services daemon, or SSSD, is the client portion um, that works in concert with FreeIPA or Active Directory, uh, or indeed bare LDAP, but there are additional features um, available if you're using FreeIPA or Active Directory. Um, it provides a PAM uh, responder for uh, user, um, so for authentication, uh, and it also provides a user information lookup facility. So you say, okay, given a username that we've authenticated, we can now retrieve um, attributes of that user, like their full name, their email address, um, and so on. And it can enforce the access policies defined in Free IPA or Active Directory. So the host base access control has a dbus interface as well. So um, you can write applications in any language that support uh, that supports dbus. So with a dbus binding, um, in order to get information out of SSSD. Okay, so we'll go straight to the demo now. Uh, what are we going to see in this demo? Basically, we're going to um, manage a user identity with free IPA. Um, we're going to use Kerberos to do the SSO, um, to, to authenticate to an application. Um, this application is going to be configured such that only users who are members of the Django group can access it. Uh, we're going to load additional user attributes um, via the request environment into the application. We're going to see that uh, we can map external groups, so groups that are stored in the centralized identity management system, mapping those groups to um, groups in the application. And uh, we're going to onboard Alice. So Alice is a, a new employee in our organization. So, uh, first, I'll visit the, um, so this is a Django application. I'm just going to embiggen this and go to groups. OK, so we can see we've got two groups defined here, um, ext help desk and ext uh, moderators. So these are the, the mappings um, between the external groups and the internal groups. And in terms of the users, what well, we don't have any yet, we just have admin. Um, this is the free IPA web interface. I'll just make it a bit smaller there. Um, can everyone see that? Okay. Okay, so users, oh, hang on a minute. Okay. So active users, we just have the admin user and don't worry about portal. Um, but we're onboarding Alice, so um, user login Alice, um, first name uh, Alice, last name Abel. And uh, we'll set her password. So now we've added Alice to our um, user directory. Now I'll just switch to a different host. So this is a completely different machine now, virtual machine running on my laptop, um, which is um, IPA enrolled. Whoops. OK, so we're going to do a K in it for Alice. This is going to require a Kerberos ticket. So if we do K list now, we'll see, OK, there's no Kerberos tickets uh, on the system. If we do K in it Alice and log in with the password that I set, OK, this is um, part of Free IPA's policy is that once you log in the first time, you have to uh, set a new password. But after this, you wouldn't need to do that. Um, now, if we do a K list, we can see that we've acquired 
a uh, Kerberos TGT, which is a ticket granting ticket. So this is our single sign-on ticket. Um, when we talk to services, um, we'll be able to acquire a service ticket automatically behind the scenes for that particular service. Okay, so now if we go to login, well, this is not going to work. Um, we can see that we've got a 401 um, here the first time, which is going to have a uh, WW Authenticate and Negotiate uh, header in the response. And then the second time, in our request header, we provide authorization, negotiate, and this data here, which is our Kerberos service ticket. If we now do a K-list, you can see that we've acquired a service ticket here for f224.ipa.local, which is the host. But the uh, access failed. And why did it fail? Well, because we're using the host base access control and only the users who are members of the Django group can log into this application. So if we now uh, switch back to our IPA web interface, uh, we'll go to Alice and we're going to add her to the Django group. While we're at it, we'll also add her to the moderators group because, say, Alice, she's been hired to be a moderator in this application. So we'll add those groups. And uh, now we will <coughs> attempt to log in once more. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see, okay, now we've successfully logged in. Um, the application now um, knows about Alice. And if we flip back to the uh, admin interface for our application, um, not only has the user Alice in this application been created, but we've also pulled in her email address, first name and last name, so these user attributes that were defined in the central identity store. Okay. In terms of uh, how this is all implemented, I'll briefly show the configuration. I'm not going to explain it all. Um, if we have a look at the uh, HTTPD configuration, so the Apache configuration uh, for this application, or the server that it's running on. Uh, we can see at this um, login location, we have a whole bunch of directives related to Kerberos here. So auth type Kerberos, um, method negotiate turned on, uh, the auth realm ipa.local. Uh, we have here require PAM account Django. So this is related to the uh, host base access control. So this says that, okay, once, that we, once we have a remote user, um, in our request environment, which is supplied by the mod auth curb module, um, then we'll additionally go through PAM to authorize that user. Uh, we also have some other modules here, but I'll just skip them. And we can also do a cat etsy uh, pam.django. So this is the PAM configuration for Django. You can see it's. Um, using the um, PAM SSS, PAM responder. So this is SSSD's PAM responder. Um, and the service name here is implied by the actual name of the file. So the service name is Django. Um, there's some online uh, resources that I'll show you at the end of the slides, um, or point you to, that um, explain how to set all of that up, what the directives are, um, and how to use them to do all of this. Uh, but for now, we'll uh, switch back to the to the slides. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, a bit about how to consume the external authorization in your application. So first of all, uh, remote user. Um, remote user is a standard request environment variable, which, uh, like it says in the name, and identifies a remote user. Um, this kind of harkens from back in the uh, HTTP basic authentication days. So the, it, it, well, when I say standard, it's more of a de facto standard. But um, your old um, web server that did the basic authentication or maybe a um, challenge response authentication would set remote user when a user was successfully authenticated in the request environment. And then your CGI scripts or whatever could um, observe this variable um, and 
interpreted as meaning, okay, user such and such has logged in. So the web server sets this variable, um, and many applications, applications uh, can observe this variable. If you're a writer of a general web app that um, is, is intended for other people to go and deploy, uh, so you know, it might be a free software um, you know, blogging system or CMS or whatever, um, you should support this. It's important because people may or probably will want to deploy your application in uh, a centralized uh, identity, in, in an environment with a centralized identity management system at some point. So um, you shouldn't assume that users uh, or, or people deploying your application are always going to want to use um, a local identity store. Uh, in practice, remote user is not enough. Applications want to send emails. They want to say, uh, hi, Alice. Welcome back. So um, that's where some of these server modules come in. So Mordorf Curb, um, which we saw in the Apache config, um, provides the Kerberos negotiate authentication support. There's also Mordorf NZ PAM, um, which provides the access control via PAM SSS or via PAM, and, and the PAM service was configured to use PAM NSS. Um, mod lookup identity is the module that, um, given a successful authentication with remote user, um, populates the request environment with additional user attributes uh, read via SSSD, and uh, mod lookup identity uses dbus to talk to SSSD. There's also a mod intercept form submit, which in the event that you uh, cannot um, use the um, Kerberos or some other SSO technology, you can fall back to users providing um, username and password, but mod intercept form submit will um, intercept those values and then on the server side attempt to use the username and password to authenticate to a centralized identity store. So um, if you hit the page with the matching for, uh, form fields that have been transmitted in the post data, mod intercept form submit will recognize that and say, oh, okay, we want to try and authenticate this user. And it'll do that via PAM. Uh, finally, mod auth uh, is a module that handles SAML assertions. But uh, I, I didn't, there was nothing in the demo that was related to model of Mellon. I'm not going to demonstrate that today. Uh, in terms of the, the middleware and the back end uh, for Django applications, and which is what we're using in the demo, um, the remote user middleware um, already supports remote user and will log in a remote user. Um, but it requires the uh, ticket, in the case of Kerberos, or whatever mechanism it is that um, is used for the authentication. Um, it requires a remote user to appear in the request environment on every single re request. If it's not there, then the user gets logged out. Uh, persistent remote user middleware, which is going to be in Django uh, 1.9, I think. What's the current version of Django? 1.8. One, one eight. One eight. Yeah, so it's going to be in, in Django uh, 1.9. So it's, it's on head now. Um, the persistent remote user middleware um, will create a uh, cookie-based session and will not log the user out if remote user does not appear in the request environment on a subsequent request. So using the persistent remote user middleware can allow you to have, like we had in our demo, a particular authentication path, such as slash login, um, that performs the uh, authentication of the user and the authorization uh, and creates a cookie-based session. You'll observe um, from the demo that the HTTP negotiate requires two requests uh, on, on every single page access. The first one will always return a 401 unauthorized with the www-authenticate negotiate header in the response. That instructs the browser to acquire a service ticket and um, request re-request re the resource uh, with that service ticket present in the headers. So you can avoid 
um, this additional round trip on every request and additional load on your authentication service um, if you're actually having to perform the authentication each time by using the persistent remote user middleware. Um, the remote user ATRA middleware um, reads the mod lookup identity variables uh, from the request environment. So mod lookup identity has populated these variables in the request environment. Remote user ATRA middleware just pulls them out. Um, that's not part of Django. That's a middleware um, that we've written. We did propose it for Django upstream, uh, and it was rejected. So we're probably going to distribute that as a third party package. And the remote user backend, um, as you saw, it actually created um, a user for Alice um, in the applications database. It does that by default. You can suppress that behavior. Um, if you're not using Django, um, how do you do this? Well, the general approach would be to use middlewares to interpret the request environment and um, provide the information in a form that your application can understand directly. You may want a system to map remote groups to application groups and roles. Actually, that's something I didn't show in the demo. So if I just switch back to the, to the uh, demo and select Alice here, um, we can see that we added her to the help desk group. And this information is also available in the application. So she's uh, in the chosen groups. Uh, there we are, ex moderators. So um, if you have some sort of um, group-based or role-based um, authorization within your application. You might want to map remote groups um, into your application groups. So you'll need a system to do that. Um, users. Uh, the question is, do you want to persist your users to your application database, as we did in the demo, or is it sufficient for them to be transient? For example, you could write them into an, in, an encrypted cookie and just have that information exist in the session. Um, or you know a server-side uh, session store, but no persisted state in the application. It might be sufficient to do that. And if you can avoid um, creating application-specific um, objects that need to be kept in sync with your information that's in the identity store, then that's desirable. Um, and you may need to tweak the views, for example, if um, remote user has been set, if there's a logged in user, uh, you might not want to show a login form. So why do this in Apache and not in Python? Um, so the Python only approach would make sense if you only deal with Python and if you need to be server agnostic. Obviously, these were Apache modules. Um, so if you are writing a Python app and you want it to be easy to deploy on, on Nginx or Apache or whatever, well, this approach isn't going to work on its own. Um, but in a heterogeneous environment, using the Apache modules or server modules means that you don't have to implement the uh, authentication and authorization logic in n different languages. And it means that the applications themselves have less configuration and um, they do less work, do less I.O. OK, so a few resources. Um, there's a Django um, how-to on using remote user authentication. Um, this page at adelton.com uh, is all of the information you need to do uh, external authentication for Django projects, including um, all of the Apache configuration for the different modules that I talked about. Um, for other languages and more general advice, um, there's the free IPA web app authentication wiki page. Um, and if you're interested in um, finding out more about free IPA or asking questions, how can I use it with my application, um, there's the free IPA users mailing list and uh, hash free IPA on Freenode. So wrapping up, um, identity silos are bad. They lead to duplicate data, duplicate um, administration effort, and typically less security because users have password fatigue. They're not going to choose good passwords, secure passwords. Um, and the passwords, you know, they're going to write them down. Um, so one password, one single sign-on system, particularly within a single organization. Um, if your org has centralized identity management, and most pretty much already do, then use it. If your organization doesn't, um, open source projects maybe have just grown up with n different identity silos. Um, start planning to move to a centralized identity management system and um, possibly evaluate free IPA as a solution for that. 
um, your web server can do the heavy, heavy lifting for you if you are intending to use um, external uh, authentication and authorization. Um, that's pretty much it. So I think we've got about five minutes for questions, hopefully. All right, thank you very much. Uh, do we have questions? Yeah, good question. Um, I know someone was working on that. Um, so Nginx equivalents of um, model curb, model identity lookup. Um, I think um, at Red Hat we had an intern or a, or a um, master's thesis student uh, or something working on that stuff. Um, the last I saw was that the project was uh, successful. I, in, in practice, I don't know what that means. I don't know if the modules are out there ready to use or if they're, um, you know, just need, need some cleaning up to be practically useful. But yeah, they were being worked on. Um, I'd have to look more into exactly what the state of play is there. My understanding is that you end up having uh, duplicate user data on your application and in your centralized management identity management, um, what's the likelihood of the data getting out of sync and how do you um, resolve that problem? Yep, great question. So you've, you've rightly identified that the application in the demo was creating uh, user data in its own database. Uh, the, what's the name of the uh, module? Yeah, remote user Atra middleware um, that we're using in this example will keep those attributes up to date. So if, for example, the uh, user's uh, last name has changed or their email address has changed, um, mod lookup identity is going to populate the environment with the new information. And this middleware will observe that and update the user object. Um, as I also mentioned, uh, it may be that you can get away without storing any user information in your apps database and just having transient users. And if you can do that, I'd recommend doing that because it avoids this problem entirely. Anybody else? No? All right, let's uh, all thank Fraser one more time. Thank you.